Hello and welcome to Newsnight. I am Ladi Akiri Doluale. It's our pleasure to have you join us today. Nigeria is said to be approaching the crossroads once again with its general election less than 10 months away and the myriad of problems for those elected at that point to solve. But there are others who think more important than the elections is the foundation upon which Nigeria's democracy is built, the 1999 constitution. They want it redone so it reflects the people's true wishes. For this group, those opposed to redoing Nigeria's constitution are those currently benefiting from its alleged dysfunctionality. Newsnight talks to the founder of the nation's leading tertiary educational institution, and that's according to the latest Times Index ranking, the Afe Babalola University in Adwekiti. Nonagenarian statesman and senior advocate of Nigeria, Are Afe Babalola. Are Afe Babalola, thank you for your time. Welcome to the program. Thank you. It's good to see you again in such good health. Thank you. God bless you. I, as uh, we were about to start this interview, I was uh, duly informed that uh, the Times Educational Index for universities um, came out, and uh, Abuad, your university, is number one uh, on the list. And I'm going to use that to ask the question, it shows, I mean, the index shows because there are other Nigerian universities there as well. But the index shows that um, we have the men, we have the material, and in someone like you, we've shown that we can have the focus. But as I speak to you, most of Nigeria's tertiary education system is closed. Uh, and we've had closures here and there for quite a while. What do you think is missing? Uh, why are we in such dire straits with our educational system? Well, let me first of all thank you for referring to the latest result in a ranking by time uh, ranking system. We are very happy about the result. Uh, this is us at number one in the country, over and above much older universities. It confirms my fear about this country. When I was in University of Lagos as a pro-chancellor, I saw with my eyes the rot university education. And I did all I could to reform education in that place. Uh, so among other things, our problem is leadership. Leadership in the university, leadership in the industry, leadership in, the, in all sectors of the country. My greatest problem here is how to manage the society. We have societal problem. First, workers do what we call I service in this country, mostly. And the same this with the teachers. And still have the problem here. And this is why I work for virtually 18 hours a day to see for myself what is going on in virtually every section, every sector of the university. How late can you get in the vice chancellor who will do that? It's not my duty to act as vice chancellor. Uh, the reason why I took over the position of practice at the University of Lagos was because of the leadership there. The vice chancellor then saw it as an opportunity to make money. He was selling the uh, certificates graduate certificates in five way Korea, South Korea, where they had an outreach. Can you imagine that? Now I had to put a stop to strike, which consumed almost half of the year and still going on in virtually all polling universities now. 
Here we make a composer that there must be no unionism. Then the students themselves now see the fact that their own teachers were not coming to class in time. So students didn't come to class. In time. There were cases where students would go on holidays during session and would write to the teacher, I'm now in London. I'll bring you a post. What exactly do you want, sir? When he comes back, somehow he still scores A class. So corruption starts with the leader down to the, the, the children and so on and so forth. We are fighting all this in this university. And that's because of the discipline which is enforced here. Discipline about character, discipline about punctuality, discipline by teachers to come to class on time, discipline about dressing, about the cleanliness and everything you now see which makes this place the first class university. These are the things we are teaching here. And of course, students must come to class at 8 a.m. You close the, the hostel at 8. You must not go back to the hostel till 1 o'clock. Between 1 and 3, you can have your meal. Go back to class at 5. Then sports, come back to classes at 7. And work till 9. And teachers are there. So I'm not surprised that of all the universities in Nigeria, we have been ranked as number one today. And these are the problems of the universities. That then brings me to something else, which a lot of people have asked me. Uh, and they've asked me when I speak to people like you. Um, a lot of those in your generation um, avoided uh, politics. Uh, and went into other fields, business, uh, <laughs> law, yeah. engineering, yeah. and all of that. I mean, I could go on with the names, yeah. uh, but I will just stay with your name. Mm. Um, the argument is that perhaps that was a mistake for Nigeria, because perhaps amongst people like you, we would have found our own equivalent of Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew and other people like that would have gathered around that person and had put together a long-term vision for the country, even in education. Because, I mean, since I mentioned Lee Kuan Yew, one of the things Lee Kuan Yew did in Singapore was an almost overemphasis on education and the fact that it was important for people to get educated and that a lot of other things come with an educated society. I'm wondering, in your case, why did you take the conscious decision to avoid politics? Politics. Uh, if I knew that you were going to ask this type of question, I would have brought with me a letter I received about four weeks ago from somebody who said, uh, Nigeria is in crisis. Now, he had visited Afibola University. Here is a place where the proprietor has his own IPP, that is, independent power plant, where there's electricity for at least 24 hours a day, where they, they have their own water. And Everything goes well in that place. Then he suggested that he would ask the government to hand over Nigeria for to have a lot to manage for five years. Now the point is, why did it why was it that I refused to work in the civil service? First, after doing my private study and obtaining my first degree. Best economist. I was offered the position of assistant secretary, where I would have my own building in the gear area, a car, and a police only. I refused. I said I wanted to be on my own. And I started law again privately. When I finished law again, there were, there were offers 
I refused. But I wanted to be on my own. When I was 10 years at the bar, I was invited by Josue Mario, the chief, the chief judge of Western Region then. He came to the bench. I said, no, I want to be on my own. Now, when President Basanjo, no, no, uh, uh, Abacha came to power, he sent to me with a, a lorry load of army to take me to the Dodon Barracks. I went, said, want you to be a minister for I said, sorry, sir. I do not want to be. When Ambassador got fired again, the same thing. The question you're asking seems to be along that line now. And what was the reason? One, I do not want to offend people that is offend the civil service. The civil service in this country is to me one of the problems we have in this country. You want anything in the civil service, it will take you three, four, five months before you can get it out of that place. I can't work with such people. I will make you start enemy. I work, I start to work as early as seven in the morning. Civil servants start at eight, but many of them are not there even at nine or two or so. I make you start enemy. So that was the first reason. Second reason, however, is that. Private business is the most successful of all things. There are private investors are very successful, like this one now. I started only 12 years, 12 years ago, and the report shows that we are number one, at least in this country. Look, a private man who grew up in, a, in private business, as a private man, and who wants to succeed, cannot work with people who would render eye service. Most of them in this country render eye service. I'm still having a problem here. So much so that we have people who go to class to see whether teachers are in class on time, whether students come to class with registers which are brought to me every day. If you have a bread factory yourself, I assure you, you want to be there once a day or once a week at least. The president, for instance, is the head of all the federal universities. How many times has he visited any of the universities? There's a lot of problem with public service and private business. Anybody who does want to insult, who believes he can make it on his own, who prefer to be in private practice. That brings me to what you mentioned earlier, uh, um, when you say that you don't, you know, for those who don't want to make unnecessary enmity and all of that, um, it brings me to what is currently uh, the rage, as it were. The proposal that you made that it is now time for the country to try to take a new course. Um, and there are those who say that, well, uh, Are is one of the nation's, if not the nation's most senior lawyer, uh, senior advocate of Nigeria, you've practiced for many decades, and that this proposal you are making, uh, you should know, is illegal. Uh, <laughs> because it would mean putting aside the Constitution, and that, um, why are you making the proposal less than a year to the elections, which are factored into the legal framework of the country, and that you were one of those who said democracy was good for Nigeria? That so is it that you have changed your mind uh, at this point that uh, you know maybe it's not as good as you thought at the time? What 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 do you say to people who have read the proposal, and ninety percent of whom you said? yourself have expressed opposition without understanding the basis of the proposal. What do you say to them? Yeah, I'm indeed very grateful that you raised this question. One, I believe that Nigeria can be a prosperous, reliable, crisis-free crisis and 
one of the leading democratic countries in the world. I believe in it. And that was why it took 10 years for great men like Awolo, Azikwe, Sadeona to sit in London with others to channel what type of constitution would be good for a country which consists of several nations. Nigeria is not a nation. Niger area. That was the name in 1884 given to Britain in Berlin when they were dividing the black Africa among themselves. It's a one nation is it to rule. But a country of nations is difficult to rule because of the multiplicity of religion, tribe, and so on and so forth, and culture. Now, they fashioned out a constitution which was truly a federal institution and a parliamentary system so that it won't be a lucrative system. It won't well. I believe today that 60% of these allies were not around in 1960. I was in London in 1960, studying for the bar because there was no law school then, after I obtained my two degrees privately. Now, I had British passports. I had the option to change my passport to a Nigerian passport or retain my British passport. But because I saw Nigeria as one that can become United States of America, another United States of Nigeria, I didn't change my passport. I believe in Nigeria. I believe we can make it. I believe we have the people who can make it. People like you, highly intelligent person like you, we can make it. But what happened? In the first six years, five years, six to 65, six years, things were going on fine. Good roads, electricity, water, education, free education, so on and so forth. And then came Ife Ajuna, a young man, he toppled the government. And the military ruled this country from that time to 1999, when they were going. Instead of handing us back the 1963 constitution, he made a new constitution, which was presidential, which made policy very lucrative. And things have gone bad again ever since. Let me briefly refer to section a minute. The preamble to the Constitution of Nigeria. We, the people of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, do hereby make and give to ourselves the following Constitution. That was 1999. You were alive. Were you part of this Constitution? No, I was not. My listeners were not. It was handed over by the military. It had nothing to do with what we agreed to do in 1960. OK, the same constitution, section 14, says, it is hereby declared that the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. Emphasis on security and welfare. You are aware that the National Assembly invited the president to come and discuss the issue of security in the country. You are aware that none of elders even asked Buhari to resign because of security. 
And those are the two, one of the two things that must be uppermost in the Constitution. I do not believe Buhari should resign. I, as a person, from 2001, had been writing, giving lectures, and in my regular articles in the papers, yes. advocating that there should be a review of the Constitution because it's the cause of our problem. Later, Bala Fionfoglio wrote a powerful article and many other others asking for a new Constitution. Most of those who read my article on this matter also agree that that is the proper thing. Because if a man is sick, he goes to the doctor, and he goes, diagnose, this is your problem. You're almost finished. That's the end of the matter. We, we all know, we, you know, I know, all my listeners know that our problem is the Constitution, which has made Constitution very lucrative, the only business. You go to the street today, go out, you see 10 young boys, ask them, Hey, what's, what's your business? Politics. B, what's your business? Politics. <laughs> Out of the 10, the 10 will tell you is politics. It has become business. We ask them to change it. Go back to what it was before. Or modify it. They turned their fears to it. Not only that, they now want to contest election under the same constitution which has brought us to, us to the lowest ebb in everything in the country. And I said, look, I'm still alive. I knew what the country was when I was born. For your information, in 1835, Lord Macaulay, British Parliament, came to Africa. He said, I've traveled across the length and breadth of Africa, and I've not seen one person who's a beggar, who is a thief. Such wealth I've seen in this country, such high moral values, people of such caliber that I do not think we would ever conquer this country unless we break the very backbone of this nation, which is our spiritual, cultural, education, and so on. I propose that we replace our old and ancient educational system, her culture. For every African thinks that all that is foreign and English is good and greater than their own, they will lose their self esteem, their native culture, and they will become what we want them to be, a truly dominated people. Now, here we are. There was no poverty when I was growing up. Under the 1665, there was no poverty. Nigeria today is the world poverty capital. And yet, they want to contest election under the same constitution that has brought us to where we are. Left to me alone. Let us cure that disease. And that disease is the constitution. And again, the same constitution, section nine, permits the members of house to amend the constitution. Let me read to you. Like, something like mere quotation. It says, the National Assembly may subject to the provision of this constitution, alter any, alter any of the provisions of the constitution. Alter means change. Any means all, any, the whole, part, or much, or all. What stops the parliament, the teachers, from amending this constitution and say, it is hereby enacted that there shall be an interim government of six months to channel a new constitution. Then take us into what is uh, interim. 
interim constitution is merely an, uh, an organ set up for a short period. Interim government are created under diverse circumstances, including the gym collapse, negotiated agreement, special election, or international intervention. They are mandatory from providing or restoring basic state services like our own now, such as preparation for a new constitution or introduction of reform. Examples are manifold. For instance, an ex existing regime like our own, dealing with fundamental crisis. Don't we have fundamental crisis now? You will pray to God to let you get to where you are, where you are going back, because you don't know what will not happen. Travel by airport, by air is risky. Travel by road is risky. Travel by train is risky. Don't you have crisis? We do. I, I read the Tribune and other papers saying that they are fairly ferry. It's asking for, uh, so what, is, what do you call it, a, a national something government, something like that, which is the same thing as I'm asking for. The same thing, yet, two weeks ago, the opposite. Now they are saying the same thing to this. That's all I'm asking for. People must lead, and the day we stop to lead, that day we are dead. Most of those who are, are, are opposed to me are those who have access to public money. Majority of all those who agree with me are those who have no access to government money. Those who want to go back are those who have access to government money. Those who don't want the concern to be up, up, uh, uh, amended are those who are benefiting from the rot of the present constitution. I love this country. I want this country to return to what I knew it was, and it can happen. The, the thing, though, is, Chief, uh, there are two other uh, parts of this. The first is that you've talked about, oh, the Constitution and the need for um, altering it or changing it, uh, depending on which terminology wants to be used. Yes. But that. That has been the case since 1999. Every year, virtually every year, every time there is a National Assembly, they are amending the Constitution. Even as you and I sit here today, uh, Are, um, there is an amendment process going. They've just concluded one, but they are still in the process of doing others. And so, would it then be absolutely correct to say that, you know, we should throw away the baby with the bathwater? That's one. Two, has to do with the interim arrangement or a national government of six months and so on. The question remains, how is it to be selected? How are its members to be selected? Because as you pointed out at the start of the interview, this is a multinational nation or country uh, or jurisdiction, uh, uh, to use uh, some of the legal terms, uh, you know, and therefore, how do you select the membership of a national government or an interim government? And how do you ensure that it stays only for six months? Because we have seen in the past people who were supposed to just be interim uh, in other things, uh, lasting even beyond those who were there, for, who are supposed to be there for the full term. Uh, so, I mean, people are suspicious. People are very, very uh, uh, distrustful of any arrangement like that. So I, I'm wondering, you know, maybe first we should talk about the fact that uh, there's been amendments to the Constitution all through since 1999, almost immediately since this Constitution was, was enacted, they've been amending it. <coughs> For 23 years now, they've been amending it. I am not saying that they should amend the Constitution. Please get me right. All those amendments you are talking about were Peripheral. They did not deal with the cross of the matter. We have what we call executive 
president, we have what we call a federal constitution, which in fact is a unity constitution in reality. We have a constitution which allows members to earn huge salaries. We have a constitution which has been tagged by the, by the world as the most expensive democracy through your constitution. They are not amending those things. They are not amending the salaries before the one we had before allowed only allow citizen allowance. Only if you took the citizen allowance. Just as I did not take allowance when I was Minister of Lagos. These are the people we want in the house. We want a constitution which will specify the type of people who can contest. People who have cases of billions of naira in court should not be allowed. People whose cases are pending in America, we, we know them, should not be allowed. People who have no source of income and want to rule should not be allowed. You must have your source of income. You must be able to show what you have contributed to this country or to your community before you can say you want to, to, to rule a country. You don't just come out from a university after your degree uh, in, in, in law or, or, or whatever to say, yes, I want to be president. No. The constitution must specify those things. We are talking of a new constitution. We're not talking of amendment. Those amendments have nothing to do with a new constitution. You can't amend what is wrong. Fraud. The constitution is, is fraud on you and me. It says it's a, you made the constitution. Is that your constitution? The answer, please answer. Why are you part of it? Why are you amending what is fraudulent? You say, let us make our own constitution. You are saying we will amend. The reason why they amend is because they are benefiting from it. Chief, That's, how about the composition of uh, the. About the composition, very, very easy. I have with me here, which I can give you, a document showing over 300 countries with the years when interim government had been set up. You can take it away if you like. I have done my research. I've come to the realistic and reasonable conclusion that if you want this country to survive, let us have a new constitution, part of which we should contain who and who can do you. Look, look I'm, I'm, I'm more worried than you because I knew what life was during the colonial days. I knew what life was during the self-government years, of 10 years. I knew what life was between 60 and 65 before these people took over. So I want us to go back to those years when you could read in the classroom without light, with, with lantern, nobody would, would kidnap, kidnap you. I read for all my degrees in, in the classroom without electricity. Uh, do that now, you'll be kidnapped by night. So I want us to go back to that stage. So as to who we select, it is the same law. These people who make the lot, who setting up the telling government that will select those who will be part of the interim government. And I made some suggestions for past presidents who are alive. All past governors who are alive, and so on. And each of the important uh, uh, um, professions in the country, the NBA, medical, this, that, so, this, and that, we select two, two, or three, three people. It's not just government it's politicians, and they should be elected or no zero party. In other words, not on the basis of AG or PDP. That was done before by Obasanjo during the first conference. So in those days, after the, 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 the takeover, and the local government were full of people who wanted to serve freely. I served freely. I didn't take a cobble. There are people who want to serve this country without taking a cobble. I served the rest of the government for eight years. I didn't take a cobble from anybody. I brought in my own money. There are people like that in this country. 
and the country will come back to oh, what it was before, a beautiful country. When you come over at night, the time there will be employment. So, I read there are a lot of people who don't believe. Because what I, I know about the proposal you made, um, and about even those who could be members, and the, the counter argument that they have made is that if you say from our presidents who are alive, from our governors and so on, even representatives of some of the prof important professions you mentioned, <laughs> that with possibly a few notable exceptions, the vast majority of people in that category are part of the reason why the country is where it is no, now. I disagree with you. The people I mentioned when I talked about, I talked about past vice presidents, how many are they? Uh, uh, former, some former governors, not all the former governors. So I'm talking of members of ASU, members of NBA, members of Medical Association, members of journalists. They are more than all these people put together. They are the, they are the, they be the booker boys and there. We don't allow these people to talk. How about, your, how about the fear of those who say that when you start that kind of process, you can know the beginning, but you don't know how it will end up, and that already within Nigeria, even as you and I sit today, there are centrifugal forces that are threatening to tear the country apart, as we know it. Uh, and that if this kind of proposal is put in motion, it can be overwhelmed by these kind of people. Because as I, as I sit here with you uh, in the southwest, in the southeast, in the south-south, in certain parts of the north, Virtually everywhere in the country, there are those who say, look, everybody should go their own way. And in some instances, some of them have tried to back up those uh, um, mm -hmm. determinations with force. Mm -hmm. And so what is there to say an interim government is put in place that is supposed to last six months, mm -hmm. but somehow such a government gets overwhelmed or taken over by these kind of people and the constitution they produce is more or less like the Aburi Accord, which essentially put, talks about a confederal arrangement, and then very soon everybody uh, has to go their own way, especially because in the case of Nigeria, almost without parallel anywhere else in the world, if that were to happen, it would destabilize the whole of Africa. Hmm. What is theory? Congratulations for, for your speculation. It's not my speculation, Chief. This is what I've been told. It's not my speculation. It's not my original idea. This is what I've been told. And in any case, Chief, IPOB is real. The, uh, uh, the Odua self-determination groups are real. If you do not agree with me, unfortunately, you are a minority now because all the uh, underprivileged people in the country are 100% support of my idea because not only is it constitutional, it is going to be prevent election into this new, into the, the, the new the election they want to conduct, it prevent it. Because if you uh, do not agree with me and you allow this election to go ahead, you are going to have the same people who have brought us to where we are. They can tell you the future will be worse than it is now. All right, I'm not opposed to your proposal. I am just asking the questions. Oh, okay. The questions that I'm happy you are, you, are, you are in the same train with me. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not opposed. Okay. I'm simply asking the questions around the proposal. Okay. And I, I, many of these things are things that people have said since you made the proposal. They've said them to me. They've said them on national uh, uh, media outlets and so on. And I thought, I mean, I have the I, opportunity I, I'm, to I'm speak to you. Now that I have explained what brought about the idea, that is, the insecurity and the poor state of the economy, which are the duties of government to do what they are free to do, 
to the fact that we have, we and others, including me, I'm sorry, have asked this National Assembly to make, to, to make a new constitution and they refuse. And yet they want to go in for a new election with the same constitution to prevent us from no diving into obscurity. That's why we say it should be done. And I'm happy about the letters I'm receiving. Let me tell you, the chairman of Nadeco in America sent a letter to me that what I propose is what they themselves are proposing. And they're coming to see me in, in Nigeria, in, in, in Abad. They're coming this next week to see me. So what I've, what I've suggested has gained national acceptance. Nigeria accepts and national acceptance. If America can accept it, who, who, who are those here who say they don't want it? Unless those who are benefiting from it. Chief, I, I, I then must also use this opportunity to talk to you about um, one or two uh, things, I guess, that you know people would look at. I know I started with you on the issue of education. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to return to that. Right. Uh, because even if we put up a constitution, our society must run the constitution. Yes. And that in the, part, uh, in the past, we have put up very beautiful documents. Uh, the 1979 constitution was not like the 1999 constitution. It was not like 1963 mm -hmm. or the 1960 constitution, but that the people you said truncated the 1960 to 65 gave us their reason, the manner of oppression of the constitution that was negotiated, as you said, over a 10-year period with everybody involved. And it was a, a parliamentary system involving the various nations and so on. But that the operators have always been our problem. And that brings the question, even if you have a good document, you have there in, you know, on the table beside you there the 1999 constitution. And you have quoted from it copiously. Um, I have had cause to read through the 1963 Constitution, the 1960 Constitution, the 1979 Constitution, uh, even the proposal that was made under General Sani Abacha, what, was, what would have become the 1995 Constitution, mm. and so on. There are certain things in there that a best practice elsewhere. But our own problem here, as many people have pointed out, has been that the minute you say, OK, this is the operating document, the, Operators, the very first thing they try to do is to subvert the document, is to look at the provisions and look for how they can manipulate those provisions uh, to suit their own personal uh, uh, interests. And that that's what we have been dealing with ever since 1960 up until now. That's so. Even if your proposal is accepted, this interim government is put in place, they produce a document that is acceptable to the various nations. Once that document is put in place, and you now have operators who are essentially saboteurs of the system, are we not going to still be in the same boat? The answer is very simple. If you had the point of reading my submission, that question would, would, would have been necessary. Unlike all other constitutions, I propose that there should be state, local government, state, and national bodies. In other words, if it's going to be local government election, there will be a body who will screen them. If it's going to be a state election, there will be bodies that will screen them. When you screen those who are going to contest election, they are not likely to make too much mistake again. How, when you, I mean, because as you've spoken, I've seen that you've put a big emphasis on the legislature as well as the executive side of things. Um, but increasingly, your profession, uh, the one to which you become, uh, belong, uh -uh. the judiciary, which is the third arm uh, of, of, of yeah, government, yeah, yeah, yeah. has also uh, been identified in many instances as uh, being contributors to the problem as well. <laughs> Let me put it that way. And um, I am spending a, uh, an inordinate amount of time on this because 
we are at a crossroads at a con as a country now. And so the decision as to where we go is critical at this point. Mm. Now, in the case of the judiciary, you are, as I said earlier in the interview, one of its most, if not its most senior member today, uh, in terms of both age, qualification, years of practice, and all of that. I, I want to find out from you, mm. uh, has the judiciary acquitted, uh, acquitted itself properly uh, in this period of turbulence and crisis? And if so, is it to continue along that path? And if not, why do you think not? And what is it that needs to be done? Hey, thank you. If there's any organization in this country today that can get past Mark, it is civil judiciary. That said, there are a few cases of bad eggs due to the method of appointment of judges. Only special people who qualify under the new constitution must be allowed to be judges. For instance, today, our judges are the lowest paid anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. I can let you have my analysis on it to US, to Canada, to England, and so on. And they are human beings. They, send, they want to send their children to school. They want to live in the same places and do the entire so on. One, they are poorly paid. Two, all the allowances are not paid the way they to be paid. Three, the appointment to the judiciary has been bastardized. Exactly at certain years, I get back. I was invited by Joseph Yamade, who was the chief judge of Western Region then, to come to the bank because at that time, judges did not apply for appointment. Judges are appointed. What does that mean? We'll be invited when they look at your qualification, your practice, your success you have made, your integrity and so on. See, yes. Ah, the statues also wanted to want to see you. I was invited. I said, look, I came from a poor family. I trained myself. I want to make money. I don't want to go to the bench. Now, if I, if I, if I tend to go later, but not now. At that time, I had only two houses in Lagos. Ten years of good practice. So later, the same people who invited me, <laughs> sir, were served by the military on television. Ever since, no successful legal practitioner would apply to be a judge, where well, somebody would come and dismiss them. It's never done. But they did it here. They removed judges on television, on radio. That's the military. The military did a lot of the service to this country, in fair June and others. Are Babalola, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. I guess it's only the opportunity to say thank you very much. Yeah, and we, good. we wish you continued good health. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. That's our program today. We would, of course, like to hear from you on the conversation. Our social media handles are right there on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast. Please visit our website, channelstv.com, to get started. I am Ladi Akiridulwale. Goodbye.